Nadine, I said it last week, but this is not a great time for British democracy, is it? Well, I think I'd have to agree with you. 14 million people voted for the Prime Minister and a number of MPs via a coup, frankly, removed him. It's, um, it's sad, it's tragic, it's uh, difficult because, you know, we, we thrive on a democracy. But I think there is a way through this. The Prime Minister is gone, he's not coming back. I think there's a lot of buyer's remorse. I think a number of people are thinking, what have we done? And I think that's evident by just what's happened over the last few days. But I think we need to now focus on the future and find a candidate who is going to continue what people vote, the policies people voted for. The sad thing is that many, many people actually voted for Boris Johnson himself. I think we need a candidate who can prove and can demonstrate, okay, he's gone, but what I'm gonna do is continue his legacy and continue the promises he made and the manifesto that he was elected on and the party was elected on. So I think that's one way we can get through this, but there is no, there's no easy answer to that conundrum. It is difficult. 14 million people voted for the prime minister, a group of MPs, ministers, uh, chancellor, his sitting chancellor, by what is effectively a coup, we moved him. That's a very difficult position for the party to be in. And can we talk about that a, a little bit? Because you were obviously sitting around the cabinet table uh, with those two men. Did you have any idea that they were plotting against the prime minister? I had my suspicions, um, not least because when some difficult decisions were taken, like when we wanted to lift restrictions from COVID. It was very difficult to get the Chancellor at meetings to, to commit to any policy at all. Rishi had been planning his campaign to the letter, launched it the day it was ready, and everybody else is kind of like blindsided and thinking, what's going on? We've all been working so hard. How can he have been? that campaign ready? Well, the answer is he wasn't working so hard. We all were. And, and I'm afraid we found ourselves in quite a difficult position. So he was operating as the Prime Minister's Chancellor by day, but effectively plotting against Boris by night. I don't know which, which end of the clock he was, he was operating in, but it's, it's obvious, you know, I think people have proven it by the video and, and other ways. It is obvious that this has been on the cards for a long time and, and in the planning under wraps for a long time. And I don't know how, I know how busy the rest of us are as cabinet ministers in our departments. I frankly don't understand at all how a sitting chancellor had any time to even consider what he was doing, let alone plan it, let alone be campaign ready, let alone be off the blocks on day one. It just doesn't make sense to me. In any other context other than he wasn't doing his job as chancellor. And of course, now we have the political establishment and the grandees all saying that Rishi is just the inevitable prime minister. Presumably no, you disagree. I, I disagree with that for a number of reasons. I don't think you can have a prime minister who has behaved when he was chancellor, when he was number two, when he was sat at the prime minister's side in meeting after meeting. I don't think someone who's behaved in such a duplicitous and treacherous way and has removed being the cause of the vote being removed from 14 million people who voted for Boris Johnson and the Conservative government. I don't believe that person can become prime minister. And, and I do know that if Rishi does become Prime Minister, then it is over for the Tories at the next election. I agree. You're suspicious that he has the support of a certain Dominic Cummings? If Dominic Cummings is your most fervent and biggest supporter, then, you, then the question has to be asked by people like yourself, why would that be? And I think the answer has to be that Dominic likes to control. His support for Rishi is kind of off the scale. It's almost like for Dominic, it has to be Rishi and it's all out for Rishi. Why is that? And I think that it can only be because Dominic wants to be back at the heart and that should be a terrifying thought for anybody. Can we go back to last week, 
Nadine, because you were living history in number 10 Downing Street, one of the few ministers that stayed steadfastly loyal to the Prime Minister. And I believe you told him in those meetings at number 10 that he should fight on. Well, we did reach the position, Carrie, myself and others. Uh, I've got to say, actually, uh, you know, Carrie has been amazing throughout last week in terms of her support, her unflinching steadfastness, her lack of opinion in not pushing the Prime Minister either way, just being a sounding board. She's just been superb. But my word's my bond. If I pledge my loyalty to you, I, I will die in a ditch for you. I will never break my loyalty to you. And my loyalty is also to the British people. And I'm proud of that. You know, they can bring on as much, you know, approbation and sarcasm and unpleasantness towards me as they want for me doing that, but I'd do it all again. How was Boris when that realisation came, I've just got to go? Desperately sad. He, he won us an 80 seat majority. I'm not sure we will ever get that again. Less than with, three years ago. Less than three years ago. He got us through with COVID. He lifted the restrictions. He delivered Brexit. So many policies, I could just list them forever. All of those have been delivered by this Prime Minister. Do you understand why this Westminster witch hunt was so targeted against the Prime Minister? And I wonder if I could point you towards a tweet today uh, where someone asked the question, who would Labour fear most to run against at the next election? And Pippa Carrera, the political editor of the Daily Mirror, who has been behind so many of the stories against Boris Johnson, tweeted, Boris Johnson. Well, that doesn't surprise me, and I'm sure it doesn't surprise you one little bit. So the They people, wanted them out, didn't they? That's oh, my point. The Remain establishment, Labour and Putin, were the three who wanted him out the most. I do want to ask you about Jeremy Hunt, actually, because I feel very nervous about the prospect of him at number 10 Downing Street. And that is because of his response to the COVID-19 pandemic primarily, and the fact that he was backing a authoritarian Chinese zero COVID policy. This is something that the mainstream media never talk about, uh, but you have personal experience of that. So yes, and interestingly, he's not denied um, what no. I've said about, because he can't- He's refused because to comment on it. I, I've made sure that every conversation I had was documented during, we knew inquiry was going to come. And I remember two things actually about Jeremy Hunt. One was meeting him just after I'd been made a health minister just before COVID um, hit our shores. And I asked him what he was doing. Was he staying as an MP? And he said, oh yes, Boris can't deliver Brexit. Brexit can't happen. This government's gonna fall on Brexit. I'm going to be here to make sure that I swoop in when that happens. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, was when COVID happened, um, Jeremy, contacted me as a health minister and said, you've got to speak to Matt. It was at the time the Nightingale hospitals were being built. You've got to tell him that you Matt don't- Matt Hancock. Yeah, you don't put sick people in the hospitals. You follow a zero COVID policy. My wife's family have experience of this. When someone tests positive, you take them from their home and you take them to an isolation centre and you leave them there in the isolation centre. That's the only way you can beat COVID. And I said, Jeremy, the British public will not stand for mothers and fathers and families and children being removed from their family and their home and put in isolation. And he says, who said they won't? And I said, well, the behavior and insights team who I've discussed this with, they, they, it, they won't wear it. And he said, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. Show me the evidence for that because I don't believe it. That's the way we have to deal with this is a zero COVID policy. Now, we would still be probably be in some sort of lockdown if Jeremy Hunt had been made prime we'll minister look at China today. instead of Boris Johnson. Is Boris Johnson's political career over? I've spoken to people in number 10 who still believe he has much to offer and suggest he could even return Churchill style to number 10 one day. Well, I believe that. It's not just me, there's a, a, I can assure you that my phone is full of messages from people saying he'll be back. Um, 
he's too, you know, you're not going to get, when you've got somebody who has um, his, his uniqueness, his appeal, his level of genius, you're not going to get, you know, a, a male's tale and pale individual. You're going to get someone who's going to bring challenges. And, and I'm afraid that that is what we get with Boris. But we also get, you know, the fact that, that people appear. He makes mistakes. He makes gaffes. So does everybody in the country. That's why they like him, because it's like looking at a, uh, a reflection. I make mistakes. I make gaffes. I get it wrong, too. And he isn't afraid to say that. And, and people see it and understand it. And, and I definitely think that one day Boris Johnson will be back. I think, you know, people have buyer's remorse at the moment. I know MPs are seriously. And uh, party donors too. Uh, certainly the party donors. And I know people are thinking, what have we done? Could he be back before the next election? Oh, I, I, I'm not going to speculate on when or how, but I don't think it's the end. He's gone now. And that's all I can say. He's gone now. What are his immediate plans once he leaves number 10? Well, I'm, I think at the moment, I think he's going to focus on saying thank you to people. I think you'll see him a lot about the country. Have you considered running for the leadership? Um, I, I have. And um, yes, and I'm not in a position to, to decide yet. So it's possible you would run presumably on the basis of continuing the Boris Johnson legacy? So, so to be absolutely clear, for me, it is, I, I have no personal ambition whatsoever, but for me, it's about the most important thing in what's happening right now is that we continue what 14, 14 million people voted for. We continue that manifesto and that legacy. I am very keen that people don't trash the legacy of the last three years of which a government of which I've been a part of as a minister and a secretary of state. And when do you have to make that decision? So, you know, it's, a lot's going to happen in the next 24 hours. Well, look, keep us posted. And presumably, that's why you're not yet back in a candidate. So, a, a lot is happening at the moment, Dan. I can't be more specific. There are a lot of conversations taking place. Nadine Doris, the Culture Secretary, thank you so much for joining us Thanks, tonight. Dan.